Well, we're looking at a 3D map of the seafloor off of Halifax, and it's color-coded to water depth. So where it's the bright colors, it's shallow, and in, where it's green and blues, it's getting quite deep. And down here, we would be in the deeper blues, probably down the order of 200 to 300 meters. And uh, in about this area here, we're running around 50 to 60 meters. And of course, that's where we thought the clay aquat was right in this position. And we now know that that's probably the caparin, and the clay aquat is on the edge of this great big channel on the, the seabed that we see here. Which would be an old riverbed? Uh, yeah, actually, probably not rivers. We think it's a subglacial drainage system when the ice set out here. There was a lot of water moving down underneath the ice, and it just scoured this channel because it really goes nowhere to the north. It just sort of ends there. Right, and so it wasn't yeah. like it was fed. From no, because the old Sackler River that came out of Halifax ran down, down along the edge of the granite. This is all granite terrain over here. So it's actually on the edge of this, this cliff. So, of course, one of the most frustrating things is each time Gordon would give us one of these locations, we'd come out in this brutal terrain. It's up and down. It's all over the place. But then it made sense. This is where the submarines were hiding. So then as they sank these ships, they would fall into these canyons and these valleys. And, of course, that made it really difficult for us to find them in the first place. This is, this is one of the most difficult terrains I think I've ever had to work in to, uh, for side scanning and understanding seafloor sediments and what's there. Not an easy place. Right, and y you can see it, old riverbeds, mountaintops. It, it's a hard place to find shipwrecks. Well, it would be, but uh, why would the submarines, you know, you say they go down, but why would they happen to sink there? Well, my guess <laughs> is that they were hiding. charged or something? Or what? They were hiding here in these in these valleys and, mm -hmm. and mountains so that they couldn't be detected by the minesweepers. Mm -hmm. And also, if they sank, it's such a rough topography, most of the surface area is in the bottom of the trough, so they're going to fall down on these troughs. It's a natural place to, to end up yeah, in one of these. Yeah, it's hard uh, to pick up on sonar. Right. Yeah, really hard. Well, what drove us to all of this, of course, was we had this beautiful multi-beam imagery of the seafloor, and uh, it showed us what the terrain looked like. But all of a sudden, we came up with a magnetic map, and this is it here. And this is showing the magnetic signature of the rocks and any features on the seafloor, such as shipwrecks. So this isn't a shipwreck? No, that circular feature there is actually a big fold in the, in the sediments on the seafloor. So what you're looking for are these little dots? Yes, if you're looking for shipwrecks, you want to find these small, tiny magnetic anomalies on the seabed. And indeed, if you look at this entire image, which is off the mouth of Halifax, there's about 52 magnetic anomalies on here that quite likely represent ships sank to the seafloor. So this is Halifax and its approaches? This is the approach to Halifax. And of course, the first one we found was the big one up here, which turned out to be the British Freedom. And that shows up clearly. Then the question became, what are all these others? And if you look across the imagery at the mouth of the harbor, there's 52 of these magnetic anomalies. So the search for clay quark really begins with this magnetic chart. Began with that because we really couldn't see a lot of these features on the bedrock surface because it's just so rough and so angular. And many of these geological features are almost the same size as, the, as what you would expect a shipwreck to be. But Gordon, when we finally got the wreck and I dove down, I, I knew things weren't right. We had the advantage of a really great visibility. We were seeing 30, 40 feet on bottom. We were free swimming, but nothing made sense. We were looking for what we were told would be a 180-foot ship. What I found was a, a mass of twisted iron with the deck frames folded up straight in the air. Mm -hmm. To me, it seemed like a really large ship. It just None of it made any sense at all. Yes, and that was pretty disheartening to us because we thought we had found the clay aquat in the past. But now, looking back, we have it sorted out. And from study of the archives and all the data we have, it's obvious to us that when I went to sea to look at the second magnetic anomaly, I was really surveying the third one. I had intended to do the second one, but the ship actually passed over the third one. So the imagery we have, uh, which we have here, that showed the beautiful bow and the gun hmm. and the bridge yeah, and, and the stern all destroyed, is really of the clay aquat. We thought it was in the position you were diving. But none of this was there. We we were looking for a deck gun. That didn't exist. We thought we had a wheelhouse to look for. That didn't exist. Uh, what we did find was a proud bow and an anchor that seemed to make sense with uh, clay aquat. But again, it, it seemed far too large a ship. And it turned out with Lisa's uh, research, it turned out to be the Comparin, a Swedish ship that uh, was carrying a, a consignment of scrap, basically, for uh, Russia. And that's the Caparin here on the seabed. And I, too, went down on the submarine, and we spent a number of hours down there with uh, Mr. White looking at it. And he saw a lot of things that he felt were military in nature. And indeed, part of the cargo of this was, I think, used 
or old military equipment. So right. it made him feel as if it was really his ship. Right. And that kind of led us off the path even further. We were seeing uh, piles of spent uh, brass ammunition casings, uh, uh, what looked like aircraft tires, uh, all, all sorts of military equipment, but nothing that told me we were on the clay line. Yes. So, Gordon, without actually going out and ground truthing, we only have to assume that they're shipwrecks, but they look good. There's, uh, you see the comparison between the natural magnetic uh, anomaly and, and something that is quite likely man-made. What, what do you think, Clive? Is, do these look like shipwrecks to you? Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm a little confused, though. In other words, how does this relate to this to chart here? Oh, there, it's actually an overlay. If you put, it, and they're the same scale, if you were yeah. to line up the lat and long, somewhere in all of that geology are these magnetic anomalies. You just don't see them because they're hidden right. in the geology. Well, you're showing the magnetic and not the contour, obviously. That's here, right, so, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. all you see. Th these don't represent depth or, mm -hmm. or anything yeah, about the, the, the topography of mm -hmm. the bottom. Okay. Uh, but the way Gordon has, has explained it to me, if you look very closely, on some occasions you'll actually see a shipwreck mm -hmm. there. And I know that's true of uh, uh, several of them, where we've, we've ground truth to be able to prove that anomaly is that structure, hmm. that 3D yep. piece of physical. It would be interesting to get a list of all the ships that were sunk. I'm sure there's listening, but particularly the wrecks that went down during World War II and even some in World War I. I bet you the Germans must have torpedoed a few things on, that they did on this side, as far as I know, in World War I. So it would be interesting then to uh, see if you could start maybe picking out the magnetic anomalies and maybe matching them up with what, what is known of the wrecks that were uh, uh, sunk. The best positions of where these shipwrecks should be on the mm -hmm. seafloor, they're off anywhere from 5 to 50 kilometers. Mm -hmm. None are in the exact location as they are stated in the military documents at the end of the war. I that know. makes our chore a lot more difficult and exciting. I've been there and done that. Then. Yes, I'm <laughs> sure you have. Yeah, seems to be the, the par for the course. They're never where they're supposed to be. No. Yeah, early in the war, the American coastal defense didn't put their act together, and we lost hundreds, hundreds of ships up and down the East Coast. Uh, they didn't do any blackouts in, in the cities, and the uh, German submarines could see them against the neon lights, the lights of, you know, the, the uh, street lights, the car lights, the silhouettes, and um, there are hundreds of ships that were sunk uh, in, in the late 1941-42, and it was almost into 43 before they finally start wising up and doing the convoy system. Well, in Halifax was that spot. The boats came from all over the uh, North American East Coast to gather in the Bedford Basin right here in Halifax. Yes. So I can see why boats like Clayquot were necessary to protect uh, against submarine and I guess mines too. Yes. So the idea then is that maybe we had Caparin in the wrong spot with Clayquot. We got out uh, John had to rush off to uh, to Ireland to get the final images of uh, Carpathia. Uh, we had trouble getting a crew. The only way it all came down was to go out in the middle of the night and to try and pull this dive off. It was rough. People were getting seasick. But uh, the grapple caught. Down we went. We found uh, ourselves on the foredeck of what turned out to be a clay quad. There was the deck gun. A few steps after that, the wheelhouse and uh, looking inside the windows, the, the wheel and all the brass of, uh, of a British-Canadian uh, uh, minesweeper. Uh, spectacular, because I sure would have liked to have been down there with you, given that I think we've had four or five dives and lots of observations on the Caparin, which we thought was the clay aquat. You're the first person to have ever set foot on the clay aquat. Must have been a thrill. Well, it is, and it, and it, it completes the story of, of the convoys moving across uh, the Atlantic and two completely separate shipwrecks that had a common story in that they died in almost the same uh, moment, mm -hmm. uh, Christmas Eve, 1944. When we came to Halifax, uh, school was just getting out. By the time we found Clayquat, uh, school was going back in. And the whole year had gone by, or at least the best of the dive season. Uh, we found ourselves out there in the middle of the night uh, in September. Uh, not the best time to be there, but it all worked out. The uh, the grapple caught, and we, we were able to finally solve the riddle of the clay quad. That's great. 